Imagine if our food were brought to us by dedicated and almost invisible angels. Imagine if these angels also gently and tactfully disposed the dead. They do not take the title of angels, being by nature bashful and unassuming. They go by other names. Firefly, bee, ant, caddis fly, the insects, hallowed be their names. Hidden in their very multitudes, the insects are a secret commonwealth of goodness, dancing in constant attendance to living things. Without insects, the birds are flying starving into the great silence. Winged messengers, the birds can read the writing on the earth and know it for grievous truth. This is what extinction sounds like. The silencing of song that should have been forever theirs. Imagining a world without wings fills me with inconsolable sorrow. The neverness, the chill at the bone, and no grief like it. I wish that everyone who said they believed in angels would actually believe in insects. And welcome to Wildlife from Carlisle. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to join us tonight, to welcome you online to join us, but as much as anything else, thrilled also that this is our first wildlife with an in-person audience. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> you know, as many of you will know, Wild Live, this monthly series of seminars and videos and discussions, started the Wildlife Trusts uh, in early 2020, as that lockdown at the start of the pandemic began, as a way of us holding uh, events and keeping those going even during the pandemic. But now it's fantastic to be able to come to real places, meet people in person, but also have the best of both worlds with so many of you joining online as well. And my goodness, there's been a lot of interest in tonight's topic. We're asking the question, are we facing an insect apocalypse? And we've had thousands of you register to join in advance. In fact, we've even had over 800 questions being submitted from you, the online audience, in advance tonight. So an awful lot to get through. So let's get to it and meet uh, the first member of our fantastic panel tonight that's going to help us answer this question and talk about all the things we need to discuss around insects. And it's worth saying, why are we here in Carlisle? It is, of course, because we're here for the Big Buzz Conference, which has been organised by Cumbria Wildlife Trust to really celebrate the outcomes of their Get Cumbria Buzzing project. We're going to hear more about that tonight. But our first guest tonight on the panel is Tanya St. Pierre. She is Planting for Pollinators Project Manager at Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Please give a warm welcome to Tanya. Good evening. Thank you. Tanya, welcome, welcome. And uh, before we go to go into, I also want to say apologies for the late start, of course. We did face some technical challenges, but fingers crossed, we should be up and running now. So Tanya, you've had uh, 14 years in conservation, working around wildflowers and bumblebees. You worked on a wide range of pollinator and meadow restoration projects in the Yorkshire Dales and Cumbria. And you came up here in 2018 to start work with Cumbria Wildlife Trust as Get Cumbria Buzzing Project Manager. Tell us more about Get Cumbria Buzzing. Uh, well, it's a fantastic project and it's a reason why we're all here tonight. Um, the project um, started way before then, to be quite honest. Uh, we had pilot projects, uh, we had development phase, um, and then we have what's quite an ambitious £1.7 million project. And the aim of the project was to create habitat on the ground uh, along um, corridors called bee lines. 
um, but also to galvanise action, so to engage with people across North and West Cumbria in particular um, to raise the profile of pollinators and to encourage everyone to take action. So what are the kind of things you've been doing? Um, well, through Get Cumbria Buzzing, um, we've been working... Um, uh, we, we, we actually focus our work on areas such as Whitehaven, Workington, uh, Workington and Maryport. And we wanted to get into communities and uh, engage with a wide range of people there um, to provide volunteering opportunities, uh, to, to provide events and activities, um, and also to look at ways we can garden differently uh, to encourage pollinator-friendly activity within our gardens at home um, and across the whole area. And we also wanted to create a habitat work on the ground, working with partners such as Highways England, National Highways now as we know them, um, and looking at different ways that we could manage our um, roadside verges better for pollinators. Because when we're talking about insects, you know, actually you can create an amazing habitat for insects in not very much space. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, going back to garden spaces, um, we were um, engaging with people that maybe just had a backyard. So we were looking at, and part of the time, we were actually working through COVID as well. And um, at that time, I don't know if you remember, but people couldn't even buy wildflower seed. Mm. So, uh, mm. so we moved to a lot of online activity when we were looking at, well, actually, why can't you use bird seed? to put in a, pot, a plant pot, get some soil out of your garden, and, and let's grow things and look at the simplest ways we can do things um, at our home, um, uh, you, know, across the, uh, you know, across the whole of the UK. And we were, through lockdown, we are also able to connect with a wide range of audiences, just not in the north and the west, but across the whole of the country. And what was that engagement like? I mean, how were people, did people flock to this? Did people find it really, really exciting? Or was it hard work sometimes getting people engaged in this topic? Um, uh, do you know, I think there is a fascination about bumblebees, mm. um, and that is your draw. I know Erica That's might. That's the go-to place. That is the go-to yeah. place in yeah. terms of pollinators. And once you get that connection with people, you can then develop it further, and then you can look at things like flies, okay, and then talk about food, um, food, and how flies are really important for things like chocolate, for example. Um, and then you open up that whole conversation. But it's more about bringing people into, ha into habitats or the space, green spaces around them and getting them connected with the nature uh, around them. And that's what we look to do with through our activities. Great, fantastic. Well, I, I said earlier we've had so many questions, over 800 questions coming online in advance. So I'm going to do one or two of them now. Uh, a lady called Anne Daly in particular asked a question for you, said, a question for Tanya, in the 14 years you've been involved in conservation of wildflowers and bumblebees, how much of a change have you seen? It's a good question, and I would, see, I would say that, that we've certainly, um, over the years, there's more knowledge now, um, certainly in terms of the messages that we're getting out to people. Um, you know, originally, when I first started this project, we were saying to everyone, let's just go out and plant lots of pollinator-friendly plants, which are nectar-rich and pollen-rich. Now we're looking at things like long grass, um, which is really good for our butterflies and supports you know, up to 34 different species of butterflies and moths. And we're looking at different ways that we can actually support the whole um, life cycle of our pollinators. So we're getting, we're changing our messages. Uh, in terms of what we're doing on the ground, we're getting more sophisticated, so especially um, in terms of our roadside verges. We're looking at safe working practices um, and we're looking at ways that we can reduce uh, impact um, and work together um, with partners so that, for example, we can use a road space um, which will uh, enable people to um, not be affected by what we're doing. Great, great. It is interesting to reflect, isn't it? You know, just 10, 15... A small proportion of those are, are active in, in project areas and there's a lot of support staff around. But the volunteers enable us to get out and spread the message much wider. And what volunteers bring to uh, our work that we're not able to do is they have that local knowledge and that experience. And when a volunteer is doing a bit of work on our behalf, it speaks volumes about the passion that's coming through from that compared to a member of staff who's been paid to go and do it. So, And what sort of numbers are we talking about here? Roughly how many volunteers? There's, there? there's about a 1,000 or so registered volunteers, mm -hmm. but we also have a, a, a large number, 500 plus um, bee walkers who, who go out on a regular basis throughout the flight season from uh, March through to October doing surveys of bumblebees of flying 
uh, one of the bees and keeping a record of what they see. And by far, that's a, a really important bit of work that we do. Great. And Roger, you've been at the conference here in Carlisle today, haven't you? For the it's, it's been fantastic. Tell us a bit more about it. What's, what's been going on here? We've, we've had some amazing workshops, uh, lots of it, um, feedback on things that have been happening as part of Get Cumbria Buzzing, but also exciting things that have been happening up in Scotland, so projects across the whole of, of Scotland. We've had a talk from uh, Dave Goulson um, based on his book, which, which was fantastic. Uh, I've been listening to that on the, on the way up, uh, on, the, on the audio book, so it was great to see it in person as well. Um, but the, the, the thrust of it has been talking about how we can share our passion and our love for the pollinators widely, not just bumblebees. Uh, bumblebees are a great way into uh, the insect world, but mustn't forget flies. Um, we might have a bit of help on that from yeah. the next panelist, but yeah. Um, so we've, we've and, and uh, a really inspiring um, kickoff of the conference by uh, Bridget Strawbridge and uh, looking at how we can share our passion with other people. And it's that love, that um, engagement that's important. Just bringing people together to have that kind of conversation and create a buzz about yeah. insects. Absolutely, crucially important. Well, Rodri, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And we'll get stuck into the conversation very shortly. So uh, our third guest tonight, I'm delighted to introduce, it's a, it's a returner for Wild Live, actually. Uh, we had Doic, Dr. Erica McAllister join us at one of the very early Wild Lives, I think back in... Uh, 2020 or maybe early 2021. On that occasion, I think she joined us from her caravan when she was on holiday. So it's fantastic that tonight she's able to join us in person. Uh, Dr. Erica Kat McAllister is senior curator uh, at the National History Museum, and she's also an author known to many of you. She's a written award-winning popular science book, uh, The Secret Life of Flies, published in 2017. And then a follow-up, The Inside Out of Flies, in 2020. You might get a sense of what she's particularly interested in. Please give a warm welcome to Erica. <laughs> Erica, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to see you and, and welcome and congratulations for being a return visitor to Wild Live. You know, there's I not, think I was, not many of those. No, I was in Cornwall. Yes. Yeah, and it was, remember, it was chaos because of the weather. Yeah. Yeah, but it was good. It's nice to be here in person. Thank you. So, Erica, you, you get a bit frustrated if I'm banging on about bees <laughs> all the time, don't you? <laughs> no, I mean, no, no, not at all. Not at all. I love it. Um, I get a little bit frustrated when it's bees and other pollinators. Right. That's my straight off. Let's think about the language because actually it should be pollinators, maybe including bees. Right. But there's lots of habitat, there's lots of environments, there's lots of situations where the bees haven't even been bothered to get out of bed in the morning. And that's why we need to kind of get people talking about all these neglected, these forgotten pollinators who, because of their sheer numbers, their abundance, they're really, really important. So like what? What are we talking about? Other than pollinators other than bees? So in the flies, of the 150 plus families we've described, half of those include pollinating species. So a lot of people know the hoverflies, but then there's things like mosquitoes, which everyone's like, really? And yes, they're actually really important Arctic pollinators. Then the, the biting midges in Scotland. Everyone loves those, don't they? <laughs> Absolutely adores them. But actually, they include the family of uh, species of flies that are the chocolate pollinators. Right. So there's loads of things that we don't think about that actually the flies are really important. And we're only just beginning to properly look at which flies are pollinating. And because flies, bless them, they're a bit mucky when they eat. They get pollen absolutely everywhere. They're great at moving it all around. And they don't have to go home at night to their, you know, to their little sisters in their hives, like the bumblebees going back and forth all the time. They're out there doing it continuously, stuffing their faces and spreading pollen. So it's great. <laughs> they're pretty important. And see, we've got to get people to love flies, you're telling me. Flies are great. You just have to look at a bee fly. You know, they are the gateway fly. They're the bumblebee. <laughs> um, they're adorable. I mean, we don't talk about their offspring, obviously. But the, they're, uh, there's so much variation in morphology. There's really, you know, there's more species of fly in the UK than there are mammals on the planet. Mm. So there's so much form. Our gardens are just 
stuffed with all of these insects. When, when people talk about flies in their living room, that's a wild animal roaming around your house. And it's, we've got to start thinking of all nature being this fantastical thing that it is. Yeah, so let's get excited about the flying around the house. I love it. I'll give that a try when I get home. I'm not sure I'm going to convince even my family on that one, but I'll try my best for you, Erica, absolutely. So, um, I mean, obviously one of the big topic, overarching topic we're going to get in tonight, into tonight is whether we're facing an insect apocalypse, and we'll get into that when all four of us are here. But, I mean, we've had a question in, uh, in particular in advance, and, well, a couple of questions, actually, but I suppose they're just, you know, just asking, well, you know, we, we often hear these stories uh, about sort of some declines of insects. Could there be other explanations? Uh, David Lindley asked a question. He says, when I mention clear car windscreens and worry this reflects on a loss of insect life, uh, numerous friends have told me this is simply down to improved car aerodynamics. Uh, in other words, allowing, allowing the insects to fly harmlessly over the vehicle. Could that be true? And similarly, a question from Philippa Smith. Years ago, car windscreens and headlights used to be sticky with deceased insects slammed into them while driving. This doesn't happen anymore. hasn't for a good years. It's, is it a good barometer of what's happening to our insects? So, so is it, or is it actually that cars are just a bit more aerodynamic? Cars are a teeny, teeny, teeny bit better. But there's some a beautiful long-term studies in North Denmark with this one man, and he has a Ford Anglia. And he's driven that same car along the same road at the same speed, year in, year out, for over 20 years. And he has clear empirical evidence that there is like a loss going on. And I've just come back from doing field work in Romania. And we've gone there, and it's the wild meadows of Romania. And we're driving along, and we're having to use the windscreen wipers. And it's that, you know, we talk about this shifting baseline. We talk about yeah. our own perceptions of how things have changed. But I suddenly saw it myself, and it was like, we really don't get that in the UK anymore. There no. is a dramatic decline in insects. It is. A, I think abundance is one of those things that's astonishing. You don't know you've lost it until you sort of come across it again. And you're right, in places of Eastern Europe, whether we're talking insects or birds or whatever, suddenly you, know, you experience abundance again. And it's, it's the most shocking thing, isn't it? I, w I was sitting there eating lunch, and I had 20 blues sitting on my hand. And I'm just like, <laughs> and it, it's just, you know, you're just like, look at what they're doing. And they're like, oh, I, and you know, we just wouldn't get there in the UK. They just don't, we just don't have the abundance. It's, it's a real shame. Yeah, I'm not sure everyone would have that reaction either, but that you had. But, you know, absolutely fantastic. But you're absolutely right. We've really got to learn to love all insects, uh, including flies. Why is it you think then, what, what, what is behind this kind of deep cultural, you know, Disgust of flies, if you like. What, you, you would have looked into this so much. Why is it there? Why is it so ingrained in culture? Well, there is the, the species that are amphiphilic, the species that hang around us. Um, they're very good at transferring our disgusting behaviour and our disgusting, dirty habits around. And so they're good at spreading diseases. But that you're talking very, very few species here. Very important in some ways, and I'm mm. not going to negate against that. Mm. But you are talking a few species. The other 6,900 in the UK are like, oh, come on. It's like blaming all mammals on us. And that's what we kind of need to get our head around the scale of yeah. it. And we need to start thinking about it. Yeah. Like Hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, the ants, you know, they, for some of them have a very bad press, but they've done a very clever thing of taking the bees out. And mm. so everyone loves the bees, mm. you know, and it's a really unfair game. We, it's our, we're very good at, putting emotions into certain things and I think we need to be quite actually nature doesn't have emotions nature just gets on and does things and we must remember that great all right well Erica, Erica thanks so much for joining us tonight for what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic discussion so I'm going to bring on the fourth member of the panel now someone that will be known to many of you delighted that he could join us tonight Professor Dave Gawson, of course, is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex and an ambassador for the Wildlife Trusts. He's done so much work. In fact, as we heard before from Rodri, he founded the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Uh, but also, of course, he's an accomplished author that will be known to many of you. Books like The Garden Jungle and A Sting in the Tail, and of course, most recently, uh, Averting the uh, Silent Earth, Averting the Insect Apocalypse. So please give a very warm welcome to Dave Gorsuch. Thank you.
Dave, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Absolute pleasure to be here. And great that you could be at the conference as well today. Great that all of you could be at the conference. And uh, you gave a, a great keynote uh, this afternoon that I think sort of inspired everyone. So let's kick off with you, Dave. Are we facing an insect apocalypse? And uh, what does that look like? So, so if you actually, oh, sorry. Technically, I looked this up relatively recently because uh, I've been asked this many times. The apocalypse means literally is, is from the Greek um, uh, to take the lid off. It's a revelation. Uh, actually, it's, and its use has been completely changed over time, so that isn't at all helpful, um, I'm afraid. Um, it's more common use these days. It's a, a catastrophe. Um, and all the evidence is that, that we are living through, that in my lifetime we've, we've lived through a massive decline in insect abundance, probably around the world. We don't have good data from many parts of the world, sadly, but in Europe and North America we do, uh, not for all insects, but for many. And there are all sorts of studies. Uh, the German one, which found a 76% decline in insect biomass in 26 years. Butterflies in the UK are well monitored and have declined by about 50% since 1976, when I was a kid. Um, I could go on and on, but it's pretty clear, that, that, and it tallies precisely with the windscreen um, mm -hmm. phenomenon that we're, we're all familiar with. Um, and also, actually, of course, it isn't just insects, although we're here to talk about insects tonight, but, but larger creatures have also undergone massive declines, and some of yeah. them because their food is disappearing. The insects, and many insect-eating birds have declined uh, and they've declined disproportionately compared to other species. So yeah, basically, if you take the definition of apocalypse as meaning, meaning a, a catastrophe, I, I suppose that depends on your attitude to insects. Some people actually quite like the idea of insects disappearing because they have no appreciation of how important they are and they just think of them as irritants, which is terribly sad for those of us that love insects. Mm. Um, but yes, I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's really sad. And it, it is undoubtedly a catastrophe, and we, we face an uncertain future if we don't look after these creatures, because we, our well-being depends on them quite directly. Well, so let's just plow into that briefly. I mean, it's something that I'm sure this audience tonight will be very familiar with. But, but why, why does it matter, to ask that most basic question? You know, why, do, why does it matter? To, to, what would you say to those people that say, actually, it's quite nice to have a few, few, <laughs> fewer insects around? Uh, so... Insects, they make up about 70% of all the species we know of on the planet. Um, they're involved in more or less every kind of ecological process you might think of. Um, they're the base of the food chain, so they're food for all sorts of larger organisms, birds, bats, um, freshwater fish, amphibians, and so on. Um, they're recyclers, they, so they recycle things like dung and dead bodies, trees, leaves. Um, they keep the soil healthy, um, they help to control crop pests, and, and so on and so on. And uh, I guess the, one, the, the only one of those kind of services that they provide that is widely appreciated is pollination. Mm. And the rest of them, we just kind of, most mm. people don't even know they're happening. But actually, they're really important. You know, without healthy soils with all those little creatures in them, we wouldn't be able to grow our crops. Without the pollinators, we wouldn't be able to grow many of the crops we grow. So even if you live in the middle of a city and have, mm. you know, never see an insect. The food that miraculously appears on the shelves in, in, that, in your, your local supermarkets, it came from somewhere. It came from an ecosystem. It depended on, on, on that ecosystem to, to function properly, to produce the food. Yeah. Um, and we need to try and get that message across. You know, we are all a part of nature. We, we are not some sort of superior being that can survive without it. Um, we, we depend on it directly for what it does for us. And also, actually, it makes us healthier and happier to be in nature. You know, yeah. There's all sorts of uh, evidence. And you were saying this afternoon, because you and I and all of us on this panel, we, we've all had to do this over the years, is talk about how important insects are for, to us as humans, for our survival and so on. But in your keynote this afternoon, you made... I, I love the point you were making as well, which is... is yeah, but actually, that's not, that's not the whole story either, is it? it it's, they're just they're beautiful things. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you ask anyone on the panel why they care about insects, I bet it's not because they're worried about where their next cup of coffee is coming from, yeah. um, whether it's going to be pollinated or whatever. Not the cup of coffee, but the, the bean. You know what I mean? 
Um, it's because they like them. You know, yeah. they have an affinity for them. They think they're interesting, beautiful, amazing, lovable. It sounds a bit silly. It's not very scientific, but that is actually what motivates people to do something, not dry facts about, you know, pollination services globally are worth $255 billion. Well, what else does that mean, really? Yeah. It doesn't actually yeah. help, I don't think. Um, and, and also, I kind of think there's a moral sort of aspect to this. You know, we don't, these creatures have as much right to be here as us. They've been yeah. here for millions of years, many of them. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we don't have the right to, to exterminate them. Um, I, sorry, let me go on a tiny tangent here. I, the, the, everyone's seen the film um, Independence Day. Mm. It's a stupid film in many ways, very entertaining. But, um, but everyone intuitively understands that the aliens are evil because they've arrived and they're planning to basically sort of strip mine the earth for its resources and, and wipe us out in the process. Um, but actually, you know, if you're, if you're a, an orangutan in the rainforest of Borneo, we, we are playing the role of the, the evil alien, and yet we don't recognize it in ourselves. You know, mm. we're basically destroying the planet for our own short-term benefit. It's mm. incredibly stupid. Yeah, it is. I was, th I was actually say, I have to say, I was thrilled to hear you talk about that this afternoon because, you know, we all, we all do feel the need to talk about how important humans, uh, insects are to humans. But I mean, maybe we all do need to talk up a little bit more about just how beautiful they are and, 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 and sharing that. And, and actually the, the moral side of it, I think that's really important. But to swing us back to the human thing, I did, one thing I did want to pick up, Erica, we were talking before when we, we were having the whole kind of bees versus flies type debate, <laughs> and uh, you told me something that I thought was fascinating about tea. Yeah, no, they, well, you see this, and they were talking about, you look at all the products, well, all the things that we, we, we consume, and it always has bees and other insects, which really is never good. And then you look back into the original research, and they're like, oh, yeah, uh, bees were quite good, but actually the most important pollinators were flies. And in fact, bees are quite seasonal with tea. And it's like, but the flies are there all the time. And it's like, seriously, can flies not get a break here yeah. at all? Yeah. And it's, it's like, it's, it seems to be covered up. So, so even the cup of Yorkshire tea, although we're in Cumbria, the cup of Yorkshire tea we had before we came yeah. on, that was thanks to flies. Exactly. Yeah. And it is funny, it's your, um, it's the, what's the point of this? Yeah. What's the point of flies? I mean, how often we get asked that I get asked that question daily, and it's like, well, actually, some of them. The last week was World Rhino Day, yeah, and so everyone's like, yay! But what about the World Rhino Bot Fly? Because <laughs> this is a creature that's possibly the most endangered creature on the planet because it lives in the stomach of a rhinoceros. But and everyone keeps going, well, what's the point of it? And I'm like. What's the point of humans? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good question, I think. Exactly. I think it's quite an amazing creature. Odd habitat, but... <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, good. You can see that the warm-up <laughs> has started here, which is fantastic where we're going to go with this. I'm, we're going to go straight out now for the poll, the first poll tonight. We want to kind of get a sense of where the audience is on this topic. I mean, it's a wildlife trust audience, so I think we kind of know what this is going to be, but it's still kind of interesting to ask the question. So the first poll tonight that we're going to ask you online, and then I'll ask the audience here, I think just before I reveal the results, I'll come and ask the audience in Cumbria as well, is very simply, do you think we are living through an insect apocalypse? The answers are yes, no, or maybe. So, you know, you've got a choice there. That if you're, if you're thinking that it might be to do with cars being a little bit more aerodynamic or not, you could always choose maybe. But um, the, the questions are yes, no, and maybe. And we want to see just how many Wildlife Trust materials you've been reading properly over the years uh, and, and get a sense of that. So that poll will be appearing in the YouTube chat shortly. And please, please uh, take part in it because it gives us a good sense. And I will come back to you here in Cumbria um, on that poll as soon as we've got the results in so we can compare. I don't want to, you know, preempt people online seeing your results and what you think. I don't want you to lead them, you see, that's the whole point. But we can go to live questions now, to Q&A, and I think I'd like to see if we want to start with a question here in the audience in Cumbria, or whether I'll take one of the many ones online. So just have a think about it. If anyone wants to ask a question to our wonderful panel, just stick your hand up. Okay, have a ponder about that. If not, I'm going to go to the ones online. We've had so many uh, asked in advance. 
Uh, let's go straight in with one from Simon Young. Okay, this is a good one to start. Should we ban plastic glass? Yes. yes. Dave, kick <laughs> us off. Uh, it's made from fossil fuels. There's a big carbon footprint creating it. It's absolutely useless for biodiversity. It's, it, it, you, nothing obviously can eat it. Very, very little can live on or around it. It's usually laid on a really compacted surface, so there's, there's not much option, nothing, very little life in the soil beneath it. Um, it, it's terrible for flooding, it adds to flooding effects because the water just shoots straight off. It adds to heat island effects because it heats up way more than grass or real vegetation. Um, it, if you run around on it, which presumably is the idea, people often say, I'll put it down for my kids to play football, it wears over time and it produces little particles of plastic which go into the air and contribute to particulate pollution, which we know is really bad for us. And these little particles of plastic, we breathe them in. It's clear evidence that that reduces our life expectancy. Seems like a really dumb idea. And then finally, it all ends up in a landfill because you can't recycle any of it. It's just awful stuff. We should just ban it and be done. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Erica, you, you said a yes there as well. Yeah, no, well, what he said. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it's interesting that like, they argue for the what was it the female World Cup, so they're to be on real grass again, and like and this is footballers if they're running around yeah. and they're the ones saying it's awful, yeah. the the idea that we have it for our sport seems a bit ludicrous. But I was walking the other day along a trail and they've put fake grass on this trail, and I'm 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 genuinely curious to what the reasoning behind this would have been because it's it looks tidy i suppose to somebody it's a strange thing erica i think we've got a problem with your microphone so someone's just kind of try and sort that way oh, it's tanya's microphone got a problem yes. with tanya's microphone apparently still i yeah. uh, i saw someone on twitter who posted a genuinely seemingly a, a, it was a picture of their astrotor to plastic grass lawn and they were really upset because their neighbor's cherry tree was shedding blossom. And they were, having, they were complaining that they had to hoover their lawn every day <laughs> to get rid of the cherry blossom. And had anyone got any good suggestions as to what, how they could solve this problem? I don't really know what, to, what the answer is, but uh, obviously not having a shit plastic lawn in the first place. Yeah, exactly. It does seem to be peak madness, doesn't it, to be honest? It's, it's hard. Well, I, I say that. We keep getting to what I think was peak madness, and then we go a bit peaker. But anyway... Um, <laughs> Uh, a really important question came in from Kate Leeming. How do we change public perception of creepy, creepy crawlies and flying pests, as it's put? Um, uh, I'd love to hear from Rodri's work with volunteers, Tanya as well, lots of public engagement. Um, what's your sense of that, Tanya? Is that, uh, how do we change those public perceptions when you're sort of dealing with people directly? I think you change language, don't right. you? Um, things like creepy crawlies, we had this uh, conversation earlier, um, and maybe put a spin on that, you know, what benefits do they give back? I mean, one thing that we say, um, they're, they may be too tiny, but their impact is huge. Um, and we, you know, let's rethink the way we speak about our pollinators and our insects and bring out those benefits through the language that we use. Mm. Yeah, language is very, very important. But it's, it's quite controversial, isn't it, at times? You know, mm. so particularly there's... You know, some educators have talked about using the phrase mini beasts with kids and uh, with children, and there'll be also be people that don't like that phrase at all. Erica. But then you don't use mega beasts. No. We don't have documentaries about, oh, it's the mega beast. Mm. There. So why, why we, we seem to make this entire language for insects, which I just don't think is fair on them. Roger. And there is a, a, a bit of a loaded... Um, terminology. Uh, I understand why they're saying mini beast. It's something small and it's looking. But the opposite of beast is beauty. Yeah. And the beast. Mm -hmm. So um, very much the language we use is framing how children, young people perceive things. And you know, when you're very small, you're really interested in what's going on around you mm -hmm. at this level down here. And it's adults who model the behaviour to and pass on the fear or the disgust or those, those kind of attitudes to the children and people that, that are around them. And uh, what we can do, what the change that we can make is in the languaging that we're using, uh, languaging, there's a good, in the language that we use, 
and, and how we approach things. Let's just model that awe and, and wonder. We were talking earlier about awesomeness, weren't we? And um, that, that love that we have, it's sharing that. And that interest and that um, fascination is there early on. And, and in the work you've done with volunteers, Rodri, if you, because we're the volunteer, rather than just sort of someone turning up on a particular day on engagement or something, we're a volunteer, you'll work with them over a long period of time. Have you seen people's volunteers' perceptions and approach to insects change over time to a project? So we have different, different um, people come into the volunteering with us with, from different backgrounds. And some people, you know, we have a lot of very expert entomologists who are coming and sharing their expertise in entomology, but their expertise may be in that and not in communication. And uh, as I mentioned earlier with uh, Dave here and, and the work that he's done, very lucky to have someone who has is able to bring both communication and that scientific expertise together, which is why the trust was set up in the first place, was to, to communicate the work that's being done in terms of research. And but we also have volunteers who come in because they're passionate about bumblebees. They just love them. Uh, and why not? We've got it easy, you know, compared to the other struggles that you're having in yeah. terms of I engaging people with insects. But bumblebees, what's not to love? Yeah. Um, yeah. They are cute and cuddly. Um, Absolutely right. Good. Well, we're having loads of comments and questions coming in online. Uh, Sally Harrison has said, hardly any insects this year in rural Norfolk. Very worrying but I do have a lot of caterpillars eating my brassica. Uh, John Connor said, we still have earwigs in the Scottish borders, but loads of other things have disappeared in the last 20 years. Um, AJW Hook said, wow, Erica, you are very inspiring. Look forward to hearing more. So you get your fan mail coming in. And actually, Richard Ashwell, uh, Dave Gorson's Silent Earth is fabulous. It's comprehensive and very easy to read. Judith has said, Time for someone to start a proper petition to ban plastic grass. Well, Judith, now there's a thought, isn't there? We might have to give that. There are several out there at the moment, um, but uh, we uh, might have to give that some thought. It is a bit challenging, I think, in the months ahead, though, with a, at the moment, the government has announced this week that they want to get rid of so many environmental regulations. Uh, so I think we've got a sort of, we've got a bit of a job to do in convincing uh, this government of the benefits of environmental regulations, perhaps, before we... Uh, push for even more ones. Um, so, um, but and that's a bit of a challenge facing us right now, I think. But anyway, that's another story. That's a bit beyond uh, tonight. We've had the results of the poll come in. I'm very pleased to say. So, I'm going to go to the audience here in Cumbria. Oh, uh, there's questions as well coming, which is great. But first of all, uh, I'll go to a poll. I'm going to ask you here in in Cumbria: Are we living through an insect apocalypse? Put your hand up if you think yes. Now, there's a surprise. Uh, put your hand up if you think no, and we we'll promise you won't get lynched. Uh, put your hand up if it's a maybe. Okay, interesting. I so, know, yeah, I know both the two people who put their hands up then, and I can see why. One of them's my partner. Oh, right, so he's just trying to wind you up. And the other one's a, a very good diptrist as well. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think they're trying to wind... Wind Erica up, which is all very good. So that was a very clear, convincing win here. No big surprise. The results online, 91% said uh, yes. 9% said maybe, which is interesting. Uh, and zero said no. So of all the people online. So, you know, uh, very interesting. So we do have a question here in Cumbria. A lady at the back. In fact, we have several, actually. So lady at the back in the middle. Please uh, give us your name, if you don't mind, as well. <laughs> I'm Rose's mum. <laughs> um, yes, I'm a very keen gardener. I have done in the same plot for 21 years. And during that time, I've done everything, everything I possibly could to, to up the chance of getting all sorts of pollinators in. Um, I've noticed a real radical, radical change. For instance, this is the first year my sawfly have not scoffed all the way through my Solomon seal. Normally, I love the fact that they disappear by this time of year. This year, they're all still standing, and that is, to me, a tragedy. Um, but my main question is really, what do you think about the importation of things like ladybirds, for instance? You can buy them online. I've had three in my garden this year. Three. And that's tragic. Um, okay. You know, 
Thank you very much. So the importation of yeah. uh, buying insects, insects buying them into in. a plot. So you mean uh, non-native ones, you mean? I, I'm assuming or you can buy them natively. Garden magazines say, you oh know, yeah. you can buy these things online, nematodes to kill things, but you can also buy ready, you know, you can buy little packs of ladybirds, I believe, you know, is that to put into your greenhouses. Is that a good idea? Is that a way forward for those of us that are lacking Dave, in certain I things? I think your mic is working, Dave, I think. Okay. So you don't need it, but... Is it, is it working? Yeah. Yes, I think so, yeah. unless I'm told otherwise. Go ahead. Oh, no, go for handheld, sorry. We're fighting over the microphone anyway. Erica clearly wants to answer. I, I, you're, if you look after your garden well, you, you should have plenty of ladybirds. Buying ladybirds that have probably been reared in a factory in Europe, which is usually the case. Um, if, if your gardens are not suitable for them, they're just going to die anyway. Um, so it's, it's, I think it's, it's a scam, really, that they're totally unnecessary for garden. It's probably completely useless. And as well as... There's a risk of introducing non-native species because sometimes the, the identity of these creatures hasn't been well established before they're shipped around, particularly the parasitoid wasps, which are also sold for similar purposes. Um, it's unclear whether they're really native or not in some cases. But also insects often have diseases, and we risk spreading insect diseases around the planet. So the whole thing, I think, is, is best avoided for, in gardens. don't know what you think, Erica. No, I agree. But I also think that we have a lot of migrating insects coming to the UK as well. Uh, there's billions that turn up every spring in our country. And I know there's one company in uh, Cambridge now who are trying to put down lures for hoverflies in their crops. And they have a result of 58% increase in crop weight because they've stuck these lures in. So actually, I still think there's a lot of things out there to help pollinate. And the good thing about these hoverflies is their larvae eat all the aphids. So you've got this double whammy, exactly the same as the ladybirds. So I think maybe instead of like introducing maybe new species, different species, we encourage the ones that are already turning up on our doorsteps. Okay, great, thank you. There was a, a question up at the back on the left. Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I'm a graduate from the Wildlife Media course here at the University of Cumbria. Um, so this might be a slightly off-the-wall question. I apologise in advance. Um, do you think the media's got a bigger role to play in changing perceptions, or particularly public perceptions? I think most people here would agree that insects are pretty cool, actually. But as in Independence Day, the aliens in that very insect-like, many other films, horrific, disgusting things that we're meant to be frightened by often very insect-like, is there something that the media should be doing to make changes in that regard? Oh, see, I know, uh, yeah, I know an insect artist, and he does all aliens. That's his bed and, but bed and butter. Um, I did a radio interview today, and the guy signed off going, I'm not sure, I just want to swat them. So, yes, I think the media have a lot to answer for when it comes to our perception. Yeah, and obviously, with regards to bumblebees, sorry, um, the, the confusion between honeybees and bumblebees and solitary bees, um, but there was a bit of research done for DEFRA not so long ago that uh, that confusion is there in the public mind, uh, and there was a notion of the popular bee mm. that is a, an, a, a, an amalgamation of all those characteristics of solitary bees, bumblebees, honeybees. And in some respects, thinking about that and thinking about how that encourages people to want to take action, uh, sometimes that can work in our favour, but a lot of the time, you know, the number of, I'm sure that you're all familiar with articles, we, we ran a project called Pollinating the Peak in Derbyshire in the Peak District. Um, our launch articles were full of pictures of honeybees and pictures of you know, articles about honeybees are full of pictures of bumblebees and even the, the products that are made and, and put out there by people who who are beekeepers themselves so they know what a honeybee looks like and on the packaging they put a bumblebee just because, mm. again, like I say, what's not to love, you know, much yeah. more charismatic. Um, so, yeah, definitely work that, work to be done and it's all part of that, that conversation. But going back to that question about the, the buying insects and selling insects, the commodification of nature, you know, th this is another disconnect. Yeah. We're not part of this. This is something we can buy and sell. This is 
we've been there before mm. with other things and it's not a place to be, I think. Yeah, and just to add, really, we're not solving the problem, are we? Yeah at the end of the day, and that's the, the, the bigger picture, really. You know, we're bringing in these immediate responses, which, in fact, um, are creating more damage. So it's, it's stepping back and looking at things. Um, what can we do better? Why haven't we got that habitat in the ground? Why aren't those insects visiting my garden? What can we do more? There was another question over here. Lady there. Um, sorry. Um, good evening. I'm a theatre student here at the university. Also, uh, campus rep. I do try my best to support the eco projects and everything across the UK by either volunteering or going back to my home country to look after gardens and things. So my question is, do in my notion or in my belief, do you think that our current plastic world could be making a big or small impact to the bees and flies and many species of insects that try to pollinate and help produce our well? plantation and fauna? I'll pass this to Elsa. <laughs> it's, they've been doing a lot of studies. So a lot of um, fly larvae live in aquatic ecosystems, and we forget about them. And they looked at the stomach contents of these larvae, and they're absolutely rammed full of microplastics. And we know that those larvae are going to be eaten by the fish and the birds and everything else, and us. So we are spreading these microplastics everywhere. The impact it's having is phenomenal. If I, I could just add, I've, I've, I think that something we don't understand at all is that, is that insects breathe through. They have little, little holes in their sides which go into little tubes that allow oxygen to diffuse into their tissues. Um, we know that particulate pollution, a lot of which is bits of plastic, as I mentioned earlier, um, is really bad for humans because we breathe it in and so on. Um, but nobody's investigated whether all these little particles in the air harm insects. You've, intuitively, it seems likely they must be getting into their air tubes and blocking them up, and perhaps uh, the plastics themselves have toxic effects. But I, as far as I'm aware, there's been zero research on that. Erica looks like no, she may be I contradicting me. I think there's been me. a little bit of looking at reproduction. Ooh. Erica, you need the mic, I'm afraid. Sorry. I think there has been a little bit now going looking at the reproductive rates now with the high levels of plastic and its it impacts. Their, their general level of fitness has been reduced. So it makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah, another reason not to have plastic glass. Yeah, another. Okay. Uh, we have, I'll take one more question here and then I'll go to one online. Uh, gentleman here. Hello. Uh, my name is Aidan and I am a student here at uni. And basically, I use a lot of social media and I see a lot of things, whether it's fake or real. And something I came across on a social media platform was it was either a synthetic or a lab-made insect designed to eat plastic. And with this whole insect population reduction or apocalypse or however it wants to be phrased, would that ever be an option to have synthetic or lab-created man-made insects to help us pollinate and or get rid of plastics, etc. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's, there's so many layers in that question. Uh, so there is some caterpillars that they are looking at who can consume, consume plastics, okay? So they're beginning to think about whether we can make them uh, hmm. Right, our, our modelling of insects, of nanobots and things like that is so totally basic. We would be dead before we managed to model them correctly. So I'd say no. But it's a lovely idea. Well, it's not. And also, sorry, no, it's not you. Sorry. We, we, a lot of them, we can't develop things small enough to be able to complete those pollination services. Okay, that's another thing. We can't develop technology... So the, the, the midge that pollinates chocolate, it's, interestingly, it's called a noceum. So it's, you know, it's like 0.3 millimetres long. Okay, they're tiny. Can you imagine trying to develop technology to be able to do that? I mean, go ahead. You're here at the university. I challenge you. You've got one year. <laughs> Good luck. Or alternatively, we can stop plastic pollution. That's the other option. Yes. Uh, Dave, go on. I was just going to add, it's, it's slightly different, 
But there are labs trying to build robotic pollinators uh, to replace bees. You know, no, I guess the logic is it, bees are apparently declining. We, we know we need them, so um, let's build little robots to pollinate flowers instead. Um, I, I think it's completely nuts and ill-founded. You know, I mean, you think what's it, what it's going to cost to... I mean, just to replace the honeybee, there are, we, at a very crude estimate, about three trillion honeybees in the world. Um, are we really going to build three trillion little robots? And that would just replace one species when actually there are thousands of species of pollinator, as we know, including all these flies of different sizes and shapes. And so uh, how many, what are the resources is it going to take to replace them all with little, little bots? And they're going to break down and they're going to end up littering the countryside or you know, Vladimir Putin's computer hackers will break into the bee bot <laughs> control system and turn them on us. Who knows? Um, when we've got real insects that have been pollinating for over 100 million years. They're really good at it, and they're biodegradable, and they're self-replicating, and they're carbon neutral. It's all free. Why the heck wouldn't we look after them rather than spending countless billions building their replacements? It seems absolutely bonkers, I think. <laughs> OK, thank you. I'm going to take a question from online uh, and also to shift into a topic we have to cover tonight, of course. Alex Montecute has asked, how much of an impact have pesticides had on insect populations over the last few decades? And do they grow resilience to chemicals? Big topic. Who wants to kick off first on pesticides? I mean, this is kind of a big theme of yours, isn't it, Dave, over the years in the, in the books? And yeah, I guess it is. I mean, there's, there's no doubt at all that, that pesticides have had a big impact on biodiversity and particularly on insects. Uh, we we splay, spray a, a plethora of of really potent insecticides onto the landscape every year. You know, many fields in this country may be sprayed as many as, with as many as 20 different pesticides in a single season, usually including four or five different spray applications of insecticides. Um, there's, there's no doubt at all that that obviously affects insects in, in that area. What proportion of insect declines can be attributed to pesticide use is a really difficult one, and I don't think anyone could answer it because, unfortunately, pesticide use is kind of wrapped up in... It's part of a system which also destroys habitat. We've seen, you know, the industrialization of farming, the, the loss of hedgerows, and many other factors that correlate with pesticide use. So it's pretty difficult to disentangle the overall impact. But, but clearly, I, I don't think anyone could deny that they are having a negative impact on insects. So I work with a lot of mosquitoes, and obviously we've been throwing insecticides at mosquitoes for a very long time. And we can now trace back into our collections, we can do historic DNA recovery, and we can see when a lot of the species change their genes to then stop themselves being resistant to DDT. Mm. So they and they suddenly evolve, and this is the thing, they will out-adapt. So we're throwing more and more, but what those mosquitoes, that species might survive, but they have a very uh, rapid you know, evolutionary rate, they have a very good to high species turnover, and a lot of them aren't adapted specifically for that habitat. But the rest of the insects, we're throwing the insecticides, they're not, the, these insecticides are not just targeting those mosquitoes, they, they get rid of everything. So our, our behavior, our, the way we go about things, we, we just do it in such a blanket way, there's no targeting at all. We are definitely, and they, they have done, like they're, they're doing <laughs> DDT on islands because they're like, you know, because these are holiday islands. So <laughs> they're like, we get rid of all the mosquitoes and then all the tourists would love it. And it's like, have you not thought through exactly what you're doing in the process? They're going to just wipe out all of the wildlife. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And what, what, here in Cumbria, I mean, has there been a particular challenges with pesticides in Cumbria? Thank you. Um, well, in, in terms of herbicides, we've been working with local um, authorities um, and looking at what we can do there. And I know there's an appetite to reduce uh, herbicides. Um, currently, um, through the partners that we work with, um, we're not talking about farmers directly through Get Cumbria Buzzing, but it's more, um, as I say, local authorities. And there is a clear desire to reduce the number of herbicides that and they what use. What kind of herbicide? What what kind of herbicides we're talking about in what sort of situations? So that would be um, weed killer, for right. example. So mm -hmm. lox, 
you know, like we talk about sort of blanket policy of, of um, just reducing weeds. And what we're looking at um, with our local authorities is looking at different ways. So we've had some quite novel approaches, and one of those is electrocution of weeds. Um, so um, some of our local and this authorities. This is in, in what sort of circumstances? In a in a in, in a, a park on a roadside. Yeah, bird? urban what? environments right. in in. Whitehaven and Workington. Right. So we're looking at different approaches, uh, or they're specifically looking at different approaches there about what they can use. But um, of course, we're um, up against that that mindset of right. Okay, let's have our clean and beautiful urban areas. Let's get those weeds cleared. Um, so it's really working closely with our local authorities about how we can change that and have that step change so that we make a difference and stop using the herbicides. But in terms of pesticides, you know, um, we've just looked at an arable reversion mm -hmm. um, and the amount of pesticides that are thrown at that. Mm. Um, it's every single time they cut and clear a crop, mm. they throw on new pesticides. Mm. So uh, we've still got that to contend with here still in Cumbria. Got. So what yeah. can we all do, practically, what can we all do on this? I mean, on, on this, this topic, but on sort of around insects more generally? I think that we all have a duty, really, to think about, um, you know, what our impact is. Mm. Everyone can, you know, has a choice. Um, and it's what we do about those choices and making the right choice. Um, and I think that we've all got a, an audience here that, you know, I don't think we'll potentially pick up that, that weed killer, but it's more about you know, get that message across uh, and out there. And, you know, it's in terms of our roses, for example, hey, what's wrong with a bit of black spot? Mm. You no, know, in terms of herbicide. And this is and an interesting point, isn't it? I mean, a mm. definition of a weed is just any crop we, d anything we decide Absolutely. we don't want in a particular place. So, you know, roses actually might count as a weed in a, in a field of wheat, but wheat would count as a weed in a, in a bunch of roses. So actually, we could just decide that things aren't weeds. Uh, Dave was making this point earlier. Absolutely. That's the other option, I guess. Yeah, and embrace yeah. our wildness as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, exactly, have that, that shift and that change. Mm. Um, and that's what we need to do. Well, Drew, what do you say of things that people practically well, do? Well, I'm just thinking that we had, you know, a very terrible time under lockdown and COVID, but it was also, you know, there were some, some uh, silver linings... And one of those was that, you know, around where we live, certainly the spraying automatically of everything that was growing on the side of the pavement stopped. Mm. And we did a little video that's on our uh, website of uh, plants that were just growing up around the pavement and the bumblebees that were coming and feeding on those plants. And uh, now we're back into the regime of automatic spraying again. Something that has kicked off for us near where I live is that there is a, a movement, a, a group uh, that's looking at, we're, we're recording the flowers on the street and keeping them going. So they're taking control and saying, we'll watch those flowers. And, um, and if they start to become a hazard or out of hand, then we'll notify, but rather than just automatically taking them away. And it is what you're saying, it's about that reframing, as, as Dave was mm. talking earlier. Mm. And, and you know, they're inspired by, I'm sorry, because I'm dreadful at remembering names, but the work that was done in London, chalking the names of the flowers mm. on, the, on the pavement. Sophie the Girl. Thank you, Sophie the Girl. Wild about weeds, I believe. Yeah. yeah. It's a inter really important point here, isn't it? You can sit in your deck chair and decide something's not a weed, or sit in your deck chair and decide something's not a pest, and, and you've solved it, really, <laughs> pretty so, much. And, and the interesting thing, we I ain't not up here, because it's quite wet up here, but down south it was very dry. We had a horrendous time this summer, and this is only really going to get worse. Mm. But those bits that have been set aside, those bits of gardens that hadn't been, you know, manicured to an inch of their life, and they hadn't had pesticides and herbicides, mm. they survived. Mm. The rest went brown and dried up. And we, so we need to have these ones that are, are tough, maybe not, I don't know who doesn't find them attractive, but they're the ones that are really important. Mm. On this issue of pesticides, Dave, well, the, 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 the thing that's coming out here as a clear theme is, is just how they've be, been used for routine purposes. They've become routine. It's not even about them being used on particular spot treatment, but whether you're talking farming or local authorities, 
they've just become something that are used all the time, whether it's, whether it's almost needed or not. Yeah, I, I, in many ways, I mean, it, it's, it's become the norm for many crops to be sprayed with herbicide to kill the crop before harvesting, which is just a convenience. It means the farmer knows when the crop's going to dry and, and when he'll be able to harvest it. But that means that lots of the crops we eat just before they're harvested are sprayed with glyphosate, mm. which is a probable carcinogen. Mm. Um, you're just to completely change tack, your vet uh, will tell you to prophylactically treat your dog or cat against fleas mm. by dripping insecticide on, on their back. Uh, and the insecticides they're using are neurotoxins that are so poisonous they've been banned for far from farming use. But anyone can buy them. You can even buy some of them from your local supermarket and drip them on your family pet. It's completely bonkers. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, whether, we, whether they've had got fleas or not. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I mean by prophylactic. Vets will yeah. sell you these things. Um, you know, you take the dog in with a thorn in its paw and your vet will say, oh, pull the thorn out. And by the way, can we sign you up for our pet care package, which involves a monthly dose of insecticide on your dog? The, for one of the products, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide, um, imidacloprid, it's the active ingredient in a product called Advantage, I think, or is it Advocate? Advantage. It's a dog flea treatment. Um, the, the dose you drip on a, a medium-sized dog is enough to kill 60 million honeybees. And they're, they're, they're water-soluble. Just the dose on one dog. One dog in one month. Um, and they're water-soluble, they, so they, they come off on your hands. If you, if you stroke the dog, they come off on the bedding, which then gets washed, and they end up in, in, the, in the sewage, and they go through into rivers. Dogs swim. We found 100% of, of English rivers... Uh, are contaminated with usually more than one of these flea treatments. Um, so that's just one example of the, you know, this incredible range of hundreds of different pesticides we're using all of the time. And we know that, for example, bees, if you test the honey, you can often find 20, 30 different pesticides, including insecticides, in, in their food store mm. and, of course, stuff that we eat, mm. um, which, you know, is it's pretty terrifying. So we've all, we've all been talking tonight about this loss of abundance of insects, um, car windscreens and so on, that whole story. Have we got any hope of turning that around unless we can reduce the amount of pesticides being used? It's, it's a, it sounds to me like it's an essential foundation for anything else we can do. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go back to his go point. On, Sorry, right, it was can. just because actually it's, it's really unfair because... Um, most people, they will, they will do what their vet's telling them because they trust their vet and they would do this. And my vet was like, your cat's got flea problems. And I'm like, trust me, it hasn't. I'm a flea expert. <laughs> and, but it's because I can argue back at them. But that's the whole thing. With the companies, they have persuaded everybody they need these herbicides, they need these pesticides, they need all these treatment. And the average person will just at times go, I've been told this. I, I, this is what I, you know... It's a, a reliable, it's a trustworthy source to do this. And so that we need a much higher up level of communication to stop these big pharma basically having so much sway about what we use and how we use it. And that really is an important thing we need to do. Mm. Mm. There's an awful lot there, isn't there? Well, we're going to go to our second poll now online. Um, the question we want to ask you tonight is, do you think the UK government should adopt a pesticide reduction target. So the background to this is the European Union uh, is developing a pesticide reduction target. Uh, should we have one here in the UK uh, to reduce, say, the amount of pesticides being used in agriculture by 2030, or perhaps more widely in local authorities as well? You've got three options, yes or no, or maybe. And uh, we... I'll come and ask the audience here in Carlisle as well shortly. Let me know which way your partner will vote just to wind you up, Erica. So, uh, any more questions here from the audience in Carlisle? Uh, I think we have one over here. Yeah, lady there. Thank you. Hi, hi. Go, um, going back to bees, uh, sorry. Um, thinking about honeybees, apparently there's a rise in, um, in, in beekeeping, and I think there's a perception in the general public that all, all bees produce honey and therefore by keeping bees you're doing something good for the environment. Do you think that um, beekeeping is a threat to wild bee or another pollinator conservation given the, the lack of habitat? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, 
important. Yes. Um, uh, there's, there's really clear evidence that honeybees can compete with wild pollinators for, for food resources. Um, there's also evidence that diseases flow out of honeybee hives into wild pollinator populations. Um, that said, there's definitely a place for honeybees and beekeepers who are usually wonderful people who want to look after the environment and use fewer pesticides and plant more flowers and all the rest of it, which is great. Um, but it's, there are often these really mistaken campaigns that promote beekeeping as the solution to the pollination or the insect crisis. Um, and really well-meaning people will take up beekeeping thinking that that's going to help, and it's not. I mean, it's, it's a bit like someone who uh, is really worried that the, the, the birds are declining, deciding that he's going to keep chickens as the solution. It doesn't make it... It's, the honeybee is basically a domestic animal, and keeping more of them when we already have a lot of honeybees is really not helping at all, I would say. Tanya, anyway. what, have you found this in your engagement with public and so on, that there's a lot of confusion around this topic? Absolutely. Whenever we go out to do stalls, the first thing people come up, they see bumblebee conservation trust, they walk up and say, I've been thinking about keeping bees. That's good. So how do you run, <laughs> how, how do you sort of gently work with them? How do, what's the kind of, talk us through the conversation you have with them. The first thing is, um, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, that's and, a good start. you know, if, if we want to look after bees, you know, because, as I said before, that popular bee notion, they're coming from the right place. They want to make a difference. Um, and they're not aware of, uh, you know, Dave talked about the, the decline in insects from the, you know, 60s. The, there's actually been a rise in the number of honeybees. Yeah, so they're actually going up in numbers, and, and beekeepers are going up in numbers. So there isn't really a problem with that, but um, we talk about, you know, if you want to help wild bees, planting is the biggest thing, you know, providing the two things that, that bees really need, well, two of the things that bees really need, which is food and a home, yeah. and that takes a lot less effort than, and a lot less money than becoming a beekeeper and training up properly and getting all the kits, and, um, and it isn't then going to put pressure on, on others, it's actually just, and, and you're still helping honeybees if you if you want to by yeah. doing that, but but putting enough forage out there, enough food out there that is available to bees with lots of different lengths of tongues, you know, bees of different sizes, um, and that's that's kind of we start that little conversation because people are coming, and most people are sort of thinking about it, or they'd like, and and quite often we're somewhere where we can point them in the direction of a beekeeper or their local um, honey beekeepers association if that's where they really want to go. But a lot of the time what they want to do is they want to just help, they want to just do something. Mm. And there's simple things we can do. And, and if you haven't got the space to grow, if you have got the space to grow, someone earlier was talking about having done everything in their garden to make it wonderful but things mm. aren't coming. But then you can also pass things on to, to your friends and neighbours. And the big thing you can pass on to your friends and neighbours is your love and your passion and your knowledge and your understanding. Mm. And that's what this day has been all about for us. It's been about sharing, but it's sharing with people who kind of already care. And know. Yeah, great. Tanya? Thank you. Um, what I'd add to that is actually there's a real opportunity there as well um, to um, provide further knowledge um, for beekeepers. So that's the way we look at it. So we do go out and do talks um, and we talk about the wider pollinators, <laughs> not just um, honeybees. Um, so we look at it as a, a positive opportunity uh, to educate people um, on best practices in terms of disease um, and also the forage implications as well. So that's how our, we, that's our take on it. Great, fantastic, all right. Can I just add that uh, yeah. in our volunteers, uh, a lot of our volunteers, some of our most um, effective uh, speakers and advocates are beekeepers as well, but they, ha they have that understanding of the difference between honeybees and, and bumblebees, but yeah. they're passionate about bumblebees as well. So it isn't like, it isn't a divide between us and them. It's mm. a continuum as it is with farming or anything else. Great. We're going to go back out here to another question here in the audience. Uh, but just before that, just some of the comments that lots of comments coming in tonight. Eleni has said, weeds, yeah, they're just plants in the wrong place. Uh, a weed has negative connotations. It's just a plant. 
Chris has said, very interesting discussion. I'm learning a lot. Thank you. I will never again use those flea treatments on my cat. So that's good. We've, we've got at least one tonight on that. Yeah, question here in the audience. Uh, hello, yes. Um, what communication channels exist or have been trialled with DEFRA or the farming community to make them aware, given the impact on the large areas that they manage? Yes, well... Um, I'm having a bit of an issue with DEFRA this week so <laughs> myself, but anyway, there's a few issues there. I mean, there's been a lot of effort being put on DEFRA over the years, and particularly the sort of debate about agricultural transition, change to agricultural policy. And as the Wildlife Trust, we were promised that we would have integrated pest management introduced into the first year of the new farming policy, and that's a way of farming that means you don't need to use pesticides. Uh, and it wasn't delivered, and we've now been promised it will be put in next year into the agricultural transition, so farmers paid to use ag uh, integrated pest management. Um, but we're nervous at the moment that the sort of uh, new government might backtrack on that promise, so it's very concerning. Anyone else want to add this? Channels to DEFRA over the years. This is a hard one to give a short answer on, isn't it, Dave? Uh, y yeah, um, I... I find it very frustrating. I, I don't quite know what's going on. Um, uh, I'm sure there are good people at, at DEFRA, but what we've seen in... So it's been a really interesting few years in terms of agricultural policy. You know, Michael Gove came in and, to everyone's amazement, I think, spoke loads of really good sense. And, and you know, it, I thought he was a brilliant environment minister. Um, and he promised to, to radically reform the farming system and basically redirect all subsidies to, to funding environment, uh, kind of public goods of one sort or another, which I think most of us interpreted as more agri-environment schemes, mm. perhaps more rewilding or whatever. Mm. Um, but ever since he left that post, they've just been rowing back um, on, on all of those promises. And we've got this ELM scheme coming in with the details of which have still unclear to me at least. And ELM stands for Environmental Land Management Schemes, yeah. Yeah, which is meant to sort of replace the old agri-environment schemes, but was originally billed as being much bigger and better. And there was also going to be loads of money for farmers who wanted to rewild their land, and that's just recently largely been axed. And it seems that, that, that government policy is quietly becoming less and less green as time goes on. Mm. And I mean, you know, to cap it all, the recent, it's not to do with farming, obviously, but, uh, you know, Rees Mogg being made Environment Secretary, oh, sorry, not Environment, Energy Secretary. I mean, you might as well tell the environment movement to get lost, mightn't you, really? I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it's a big kind of two fingers up, I think. Um, and the fracking announcement today and so on and so on. It's really hard to be optimistic about where we're going in with, with environmental policy. And the, also the threat, apparently, according to Twitter, and the Wildlife Trust on Twitter, I believe that there's rumours of a sort of bonfire of environmental regulations getting yeah. into the Habitats Directive and so on and so on, which would be catastrophic if it happens. So it's a really worrying time right now with regard to government policy. DEFRA, I, I obviously, is, is a sort of wing of government and they sit rather awkwardly, I think. Uh, I don't know, the, the, the direction of government policy has changed so rapidly, I'm not sure that they're really able to keep up, but mm. uh, uh, they're very hard to communicate with directly to answer the original question. Yeah. Rodri and Tanya, you've, uh, how, how much have you engaged with farmers, uh, particularly in this part of the world, around this, these kind of topics? And, and presumably, you know, to what extent do you find farmers really keen to improve their practices, but, but maybe need a bit of help in that regard? Uh, well, first off, to pick up on that point, I think there's a lot of uncertainty with yeah. farmers at the moment, especially moving on to the, the new ELM scheme. Obviously, a huge amount of uncertainty. So, you know, in that time frame, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of farmer choices of what they're going to choose to do. Um, but all the farmers that I've worked with personally have a, a desire to do um, good on their land and working closely with them on projects like get can be buzzing and plant of pollinators, it's almost we're like we're t talking to the converted, which for us is fantastic. Um, and where I live in in West Cumbria, um, 
we're looking at a lot of FIPL projects, so farming in the wide landscape and working together. But that's more farmers that have a, a real aim in terms of conservation. But we're finding you know, quite a few groups of farmers collectively uh, pulling together to look at different ways of farming, um, which is positive. Um, and it's fantastic, but as I say, a lot of uncertainty there, um, especially in Cumbria and hill farming. Yes, no, I, I'll just echo that, that our experience working in, uh, in Derbyshire, in the Peak District, on our project that we were doing before, um, <coughs> and across the country with, with Bumblebee Conservation Trust, is we've got lots of farmers who are really keen as custodians of the land to to do something positive for wildlife and, and works really well with us. And, you know, uh, sometimes people, again, it, it's kind of like beekeepers, you know, uh, farmers have lives beyond farming as well. They have mm. families, they have extended families. And uh, certainly under lockdown, when we were limited as to where we could do bee walks, our farming communities were able to keep those bee walks going, so. Yeah, great. Well, I said before we, we had an online poll uh, and it's now your turn here in uh, Carlisle as well to answer this question. Um, do you think the UK government should adopt a pesticide reduction target? Put your hand up, please, if you think the answer is yes. Obviously resounding yes there. Anyone no? Just no. Well, anyone a maybe? Oh, we've got a possible maybe there. Okay, interesting. So, uh, resounding yes, the answers online were yes with 96%, 4% maybe, so that's kind of reflecting the same here, uh, and no one said no online as well. So very clear uh, view there from our online and in-person audience about adopting pesticide reduction target. It's one of those things that I think is really interesting, isn't it? You know, no matter how anyone voted in the Brexit referendum, there was that clear promise to maintain and enhance environmental regulations after Brexit, and we've heard today that some of those environmental regulations are gonna be ripped up, which is really concerning. Uh, and there's a second thing is, even whether we lose the ones we've already got, do we keep pace with other countries in the EU around the world as they improve regulations further? I think quite a lot to debate there. Um, well, I think we have another question up here in the audience in Carlisle. Thank you. Hi, can I ask what the panel's thoughts are on the effects of light pollution on our insects? Oh, very good, yes. So, question about light pollution. And we've actually had that question come in online from several people as well, uh, the impacts on light pollution. Who wants to kick off on that? Erica? Uh, just because I've got the microphone. I like this. <laughs> um, yeah, huge. Um, we forget about uh, nocturnal pollinators a lot. Everyone does discuss the diurnal pollinators. And the, the pollinators that a lot of people don't like, the mosquitoes and the midges, they're all nocturnal. And they're quite important for so many different plants, trees, etc. And urban light pollution is shocking. So, it ha yeah, I'm very concerned about it. Light, light pollution has some quite subtle effects that have only recently been discovered. And it, obviously, if there are lights at night, you, you flying insects like moths and flies get attracted to the lights and bash themselves to death on them or are easily picked off by bats and spiders and so on, which is bad. But there are other less obvious effects. Um, so, for example, there's, there's evidence that artificial lights at night in the winter can fool insects into thinking spring has arrived because it makes it seem like the day is longer than it actually is. So they emerge from hibernation at the wrong time and it's still winter and they're doomed. Um, and there's even a really interesting study that showed that um, so some dung beetles, well, they make up a little ball of dung and they push it along behind them in the way everyone's seen on television. But they do it at night and they use the light of the Milky Way to orientate themselves so that they can go in a straight line. Uh, and if there's artificial lights, they can't detect the Milky Way, so they go all over the place and get lost, poor things. So there are all sorts of kind of effects that, that are you know, not at all obvious and probably others we've yet to discover. And it's also the combination, isn't it? It's that, it's the impacts of light pollution along with the impacts of pesticides and the impacts of loss of habitat com combined, is it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like a kind of perfect storm. In insects are really tough and adaptable. You know, they've been around for 480 million years. Um, they survived the mass extinction events that wiped out the dinosaurs and lots of other organisms. Um, but right now, you know, we're bombarding them with all, from every angle with all these different different problems and you know they could adapt and overcome one or two perhaps but not everything at once 
Well, sadly, we're quickly running out of time here in Carlisle tonight and online. And uh, even though we started later, we know we've got to wrap it up fairly soon. I just want to see if there's any final burning question from our in-person audience. There, there's one here. If we do it quickly, we'll fire that. Then I've got one last question for you each. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of information out there about what we can do to help pollinators, and that's very focused on providing food in the form of nectar and pollen, and sometimes habitat mainly focused on bees. So a question really for Erica, do flies that are not after pollen and nectar need our help, and what could we do to help them? Yes. So... Um there's a, well, most of, there's a lot that are, but what we, we think about most of the time with insects is we think about the adult stage. We always ignore the larval stage, and the larval habitat is really critical because for a lot of insects, apart from baby bees, what do you do? Nothing. <laughs> but actually, actually other insects, their babies are out there working from day dot. And so we've got to think about their habitat. So ponds, aquatic ecosystems, like half the flies, the, the, uh, basically their larvae are in these systems. So we've got to maintain our waterways. But we have to provide them with decomposing habitats and things like that. The whole, I don't, again, we talk about, I don't want to say messy, but just giving more thought to a greater diversity of habitat is beneficial for all of the insects. And we need the decomposers, and we need the predators, and we need the parasitoids, the AE. We need all of these things in our ecosystem to make it healthy. Pollinators are great, but they need everything else as well. Okay, great. Well, we've had so many comments coming in tonight. Uh, thank you so much for sharing them. And it's been really buzzy there online, I'm delighted to say. Um, as well as here. Uh, but I just want to share with the panel this comment, uh, which I think we've certainly got through to a few people about the pet stuff tonight. Fiona Lunn has said, I comb my dogs with a fine tooth flea comb every day. The dogs love the grooming and I love popping the fleas. Sorry, Erica. Uh, no chemicals, just time five minutes every day. So thank you so much for all your engagement online tonight. I want to come to each of you in turn now, just a final question, and if I can, and it's the obvious one I've got to do. What's your favourite insect, then? <laughs> oh, well, that's easy. There's got to be a bumblebee. Oh. <laughs> and it's a Bombus monticola, our mountain, or bilberry bumblebee. And I'm delighted to have them here in Cumbria. Uh, and uh, we have them actually coming down to the fells to feed, our, uh, feed in spring. And it's such a delight Why to see them. Why are they so special? The colours. Oh. I mean, absolutely beautiful. Um, abdomen it's that bright copper kettle color it's absolutely gorgeous what's not to love about them <laughs> Rodri. oh at the risk of uh, echoing bilby bumblebee is is definitely up there with me, with me. Uh, but um I've, as that's already taken then i'm afraid it is another bumblebee but it is it is the common card of bumblebee bombus bisquorum who just looks like a little stripy tiger. It really is when we go into our garden, we've got that wild animal in our garden. You don't need to go far. And if you haven't got a garden, you can just walk out and it's there on the road. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's a fly. <laughs> no, I, mine's a bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, obviously. Because <laughs> um, I, I like form and functionality. And um, I've got obviously. Oh, I, uh, I don't have kids, but I presume this is one they ask you, which is, do you have any favourites? And you go, no. Mm. And you obviously do have a favourite. <laughs> um, so I will pick the obvious one. I will go for the bee fly, Bombilius Major, just because, A, it's her suit as anything. So we've got to love that. Beautiful moustaches, even with the females. You've got this amazing, irreversible proboscis. So it can just go in and out which for functionality, for getting into the deep tubular plants, is absolutely amazing. And she has, the female has a bum bag, and she gathers sand in her bum bag. She's the best, worst example of maternal care on the planet. She just hurls eggs around the garden, which is great. And then what do they eat? The eggs and the larvae? Bees! 
cheese. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's, that's what nature is. There's a, there's a whole, whole thing going on there. And they're an indication of a very healthy, you know, mining bees, ground bees, because for their numbers to do well, the bees have to do well. So it's a lovely system. And they tell you that spring has arrived. And that's lovely. When you see a bee fly in your garden, I'm late to work. Fantastic. Dave? Um, it would be so easy to pick a bee, obviously, <laughs> but I'm, just to wind up, Erica, it's almost okay. worth doing. But I'm not, I'm not going to, because we've had two bees. Um, I'm going to choose the earwig, mm. just Aww, because it's, nice. it re encapsulates, it represents the, the kind of creepy crawlies that nobody cares for or, or loves. And actually, they're really fascinating, earwigs. Uh, they're important biocontrol agents. They shin up trees at night and eat lots of aphids and, and whatnot. Um, they're, they're, they show parental care. So the female earwig makes a little nest and, and lays her eggs and looks after them and licks them. And when they hatch, she guards them until they're about half grown. And then she shoes them off like someone trying to get rid of their teenagers. And if they don't go at that point, she eats them. So she's not the perfect <laughs> mother. Um, and, and, and also, male earwigs have two penises, uh, and they'll happily snap one off if they need to. <laughs> so all in all, they're just pretty cool, and, and they deserve more respect, and they don't climb into ears. Well, that's a fantastic way to end, <laughs> Dave. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for engaging tonight. For all the audience online, thank you so much for joining us. All your comments, all your questions. And, and please do actually just keep engaging on this incredibly important topic. And thank you to the audience here in Carlisle as well. Huge thanks actually to the venue as well, the University of Cumbria, who've hosted us here tonight and everyone that's been involved in putting this on in Carlisle uh, uh, tonight. And thank you to the audience for all your brilliant questions as well. But obviously, I want to finish by saying a huge thank you to our brilliant panel tonight, to Tanya, to Rodri, to Erica and Dave. Please give a warm round of applause. for a fantastic discussion about insects, how they're threatened, but how, what we can try and do about it, but perhaps even more importantly, how much we should love them so much more. Uh, our next wildlife is uh, next month in October will be focused on equality, diversity, and inclusion in the environment sector, a very important topic, and we've got a fantastic panel come together uh, for that as well. And we've got a very exciting wildlife that we're planning for November as well that might be getting a little bit more political as well. So look out for details of that uh, and we'll share them from the Wildlife Trust as soon as we possibly can. But really, I just want to finish tonight by saying again from all of us at the Wildlife Trust, thank you so much for the panel for joining us tonight. Thank you for the audience that have joined us here in person and to you online. And I want to say personally thank you to the fantastic wildlife team behind the scenes that have been putting this on brilliantly as well. Just remember just how important those insects are and how much we should love them all. If we decide that there's no pests, if we decide there's no weeds, there really aren't and we can celebrate the true diversity of life on this planet and perhaps restore the abundance of it as well. What a nice thought. From Carlisle and from the great, uh, for the big buzz conference here in Carlisle, thank you and good night. Thank you all.